Oswald Chambers once said that the prayer of the feeblest saint who lives in the spirit and keeps right with God is a terror to Satan. The very powers of darkness are paralyzed by prayer. No wonder Satan tries to keep our minds fussy in active work till we cannot think in prayer. <coughs> Jesus not only spent a great deal of time in prayer himself, but he also took the time to teach his disciples how to pray because he knew how important it was going to be for them and how important it is. As prayer is what taps us in to the source of life in all the universe as we can have a conversation with Almighty God. And during the past several weeks, we've been in the book of Matthew in chapter 6 where we find the first of the occasions where Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray. And what he said as he spoke to them was, he said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, he said, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And that's what we've seen so far. And we come to God, Jesus tells us, when we come to him, we come to him as our father. And we think about who we are actually speaking to. We take some time to remember who he is and why it is that we can call him our father. Because as what Brandon just read a moment ago, we don't come into the world with that relationship, but we come into this world in the kingdom of darkness. But God in his love for us sent his only son Jesus to die on a cross to take our sins away, raised him from the dead so that it's all paid for, it's all taken care of, and by simple childlike faith, with the faith of a child, we can believe that and be accepted with God as our Father. And we are to think about that relationship every time we speak to Him. Remember who He is and why we can call Him Father. And as we do so, we remember that His name is hallowed. His name is holy. It's set apart from everybody else. And, and as we come to him, we are setting his name apart as holy in our hearts. And we want him to be holy in our hearts in everything that we do. And because he is holy and awesome and he's taken us out of that kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God's son, the desire of our hearts is that he would rule our hearts, that he would be king in our hearts. And for him to be king over everyone, that he would rule every heart. And we know that one day he will because one day the Bible tells us that Jesus is going to come again and he is going to set up his kingdom here on this earth. And so we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we line our desires and our thoughts up with his and we look forward to that day when he really is coming. But while we're waiting for that, we long for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven in our life. We want his will to be done in our marriage. We want his will to be done in the way we're raising children. We want his will to be done the way we spend our money and our relationships with our brothers and sisters. And while we're waiting, we're seeking to bring more people into his kingdom so that they can come to know him too. And while we're doing this here on earth as we're living on earth, stands to reason that we have earthly needs. We have things that we need like food and water and shelter. And so Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And we're reminded as we do so that, that we do need our daily bread from God alone. He's the only one who can really provide it. And as we do so, he also addresses a spiritual need that we have, a very great one. That as we ask him for our daily bread, that we also ask him to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You see, even though we've been taken out of that prison house of sin like we talked about last week, we've been taken out of that kingdom of darkness never to return. The sad fact is, is that we still sometimes sin against each other, don't we? We still are capable of doing bad things. And as we do those things, we need to come to our Father for that daily cleansing. 
to, and we, just, we confess that to him and he forgives us. And as we do so, we do so saying, as we have forgiven our debtors. Because there's no one who can truly know and comprehend what Jesus did for us on the cross and understanding that it was my sin that put Jesus there, that caught my sin that caused Jesus to die, to save me. And in his kindness and his mercy, he's forgiven me. And so how in the world could I even think that I could withhold forgiveness from somebody else who needs it? And if our heart has been melted by his grace and mercy, we're going to be ready to forgive others as well. And that's where we finished up last week. And so having been forgiven... And cleansed from our sin. You've just confessed your sin to the Lord. He's forgiven you. And you're clean. It just stands to reason now that you want to stay clean, don't you? We want to be clean. And so what Jesus teaches us to pray next is to lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. Which is what we're going to be spending some time on today. And as we've been forgiven and made clean, we just want to stay clean. You know, after you, you, know, you come home and you're filthy dirty and you've got hog slop all over. I used to hike in the mountains with the, with, with the Awa and I would come home, I mean, literally looking like I had ridden a muddy horse for, you know, 20 miles. I mean, I was just covered with mud all the way up here and I had mud splatters on my face and in my hair. And you get in there and you get to shower and you're all cleaned up and... And the last thing you feel like doing is going and getting in the mud again. And, and spiritually speaking, you know, if we've been made clean, if we've been cleansed from something that we've done, we don't want to go back and do the same thing again. And so we ask the Lord to, to not to lead us into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. Because the Word of God teaches that every person who really can call God their father is going to have a longing to be pure and holy and clean like he is. Look at what it says in 1 John. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. And the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. And get this last sentence. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. You know, it's the most natural thing in the world for a trusting little child to want to be like his father. And all of us have seen pictures and maybe put them on Facebook ourselves of, a little child who's imitating his dad, trying to do what he does, whether it's pushing a lawnmower or shaving at the sink. And, and as our father is pure and holy and righteous, and we've been born into his family, then we've been given a new nature that wants to be pure and holy and clean like he is. And so we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And just as we go to our Heavenly Father with our physical needs for daily bread, we go to Him every day with our vulnerability to sin. We, we bring that need to Him every day, knowing the places where we're weak, the places where we've fallen, the places where we've been tempted. And we say, Lord, please don't let me fall into that again. And we need to make sure that we do this every day. Now, the question has been asked, and I want to look at three questions this morning. A why, a what, and a where. And the first question that's been asked is, is why would Jesus teach us to pray this way? And this petition, lead us not into temptation, has actually been the source of a bit of controversy over the years. And just uh, recently, actually made international news as the leader of a particular re religious organization... Uh, endorsed the idea that we ought to do a little bit of tweaking and, and change this so that it doesn't say, lead us not into temptation, but, but keep us from falling into temptation. And his line of reasoning was, he said, a father wouldn't do that. A father would never lead his child into temptation. And, and I'm quoting here, he says, a father doesn't do that. 
A father helps you get up immediately. It's Satan who leads us into temptation. That's his department. The logic being that God would never lead anyone into temptation, and since he wouldn't, we ought not to pray that way. There's some serious problems, both with seeking to change the scripture and also with the rationale behind it. Because first of all, is there any human being alive who is qualified to decide what God would do or what God would not do based on his own wisdom? <laughs> and yet people do it all the time, don't they? You ever hear this one? Well, I just know God would never send anyone to hell. God would, a loving God would never allow someone to burn in hell for all eternity because God is love. He, he wouldn't do that. And yet when they read in Matthew 25, 46, where Jesus said, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, well, well that just can't mean that. that. That just can't be true. I just can't accept that because I don't believe God would do that. And John Piper has a saying I thought was really good. He calls this doing a hermeneutical headstand. And what that means is, is interpreting the Bible upside down. It's coming to the scripture with my ideas of what I think God is like, or what I believe God is like, and then interpreting and making the scripture fit my filter, making it fit my way of thinking. And that's upside down. Because the word of God is God's revelation to us. It's him telling us what he is like and who he is. And we have to come to it with that mindset that this is him revealing himself to us, not us deciding who he is and, and trying to make him fit our preconceived notion of that. Once again, I thought he, he, he said it well when he, when he, when he said that in, in talking about um, this idea of a hermeneutical headstand, he said, my point is we should learn whether he does or not from Scripture and not from our prior notions of what good fathers do. It's a very dangerous thing to base your understanding of Scripture based on what you think God would do or what he wouldn't do because you may not know what God would do or wouldn't do or why he would do it. And as Jesus told us to pray this way, uh, for my part, I'm just going to pray the way Jesus told us to pray. It just as a matter of, of simple obedience. But not only that, but you know one of the greatest things that prayer does for us? Prayer isn't just all about us getting the things that we want or even about us getting the things that we need. You know what prayer does? Prayer puts us in sync with reality. Prayer puts us in sync it puts us back in line with the reality of who God is and when we pray your kingdom come your will be done we are recognizing the reality that this is God's world after all he made it he made us and and while the Bible teaches that Satan's ruling it for a little while and he has control over most of its people one day Jesus is going to come and he's going to take it back and he's going to set up his kingdom here on this earth. And so we pray, when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, we are lining ourselves up with the reality of who God is and, and, and lining our heart up with his heart and what he wants to see done. And when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we're putting ourselves in sync with the reality that our daily bread really does come from God. Friend, there is not a piece of meat in your freezer there is not a box of crackers on your shelf. There is not a can of beans in your basement that did not ultimately come from God. And you would not have it if God did not let you have it. It all goes back to God. And so when we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, what we're doing is we're putting ourselves in sync with reality that we need to depend on our Father to keep us from evil. And we can't do it by ourselves. We avail ourselves to the power that he has provided for us to be clean through the blood of Christ and to stay clean in avoiding sin. So that's the why. Let's take a look a minute at the what. As it says, what do these words mean? Uh, 
Jesus, as he's telling us, lead us not into temptation. I, I find it's always interesting when you find a word in the Bible to, to go and to, and to do a little bit of study and find out what that word means and how it is used other places in Scripture. And you don't have to be a Greek scholar to do this. I'm certainly no Greek scholar, believe me. But if you'll take something that's called an exhaustive concordance of the Bible, or you can download an app to your phone. I'm sure Brandon can show you how to do that. And, and take a look at what these words mean. And, and how they're used in other places in Scripture. And this word lead, when he says lead us not into temptation, has the idea of to bring in or to carry inward. And it's the same word that we find in, um, in Luke chapter, of, in, in the Gospel of Luke, where it says some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. It's also the same word we find in 1 Timothy where it says that for we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of the world. And it's the same word found in Hebrews 13 where we're told about the Old Testament sacrifices that, uh, that the bodies of those animals were brought into the holy place by the high priest and as a sacrifice, in the, in the sin, and they were burned outside the camp. And these things were brought outside. And so as we go to our Heavenly Father, we ask Him to lead us not into temptation. Excuse me, I got ahead there. We are, we are recognizing the fact that ultimately God is sovereign over our life, and, and He controls who we are. And we are placing ourselves in His control and asking Him, Lord, don't bring us into those situations where we might be tempted to sin. And once again, I, I really like a quote that uh, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said. As he said, we are asking that we should never be led into a situation where we are liable to be tempted by Satan. It does not mean we are dictating to God what he shall or shall not do. But though it does not mean that we are to dictate to God, it does mean that we may request of him that if it be in accordance with his holy will, he should not lead us into positions where we can be so easily tempted and whether we are, where we are liable to fall. And since I was a child, one of the besetting sins of my life has always been my mouth. If there's anything I can remember my dad saying to me when I was growing up over and over and over again, his son... You just don't know how you sound. You know, words can be like knives and like bullets. And sometimes we're just so careless with them. And as if, you know, some, some ignorant child is going into a shopping mall blindfolded and just spraying bullets all over the place. And we go and we talk and we just sling words around and then we go out. And we have no idea about how that our words are wounding people and leading, leaving them sorrowful and bleeding and and, my, and I'm very thankful that my father recognized this tendency in me when I was a young person with just such a sharp tongue and, and over the years a, a verse that I've learned and something that I pray very often is Psalm 141 3 which says set a guard O Lord over my mouth keep watch over the door of my lips but another thing that I'm also learning to pray is that, Lord, don't just set a guard over my lips, but, Lord, don't even bring me into a situation where I'll be tempted to say things that I ought not to say. Especially if I think I'm going to be going into a situation that may be tense or, where, or some meeting where, where there may be something that needs to be discussed. Lord, if it be your will, don't even let it get to the point to where I'm going to be tempted to say something that I ought not to say. And you can do that for any temptation. Any temptation at all. Um, Lord, don't even let me get into a situation where I'm going to be tempted to spend money that I don't have. Lord, don't even let me get into a situation where I'm going to be tempted to, to go back into this old destructive habit that I used to have. Lord, don't even let me get into a situation. God forbid that I would ever be in a situation where I would be even tempted to be unfaithful to my wife. And as we go to him this way, we ask him not to bring us to those places. And then there's the word temptation. And if you look up the word temptation 
in your concordance, you'll see that it can be translated in one or two or three ways. And in our English Bible, such as the ESV or the King James, it's translated all three ways where it can, depending on the context, it can mean a trial or a test as well as a temptation to do something wrong. And a couple of examples of this, for example, in, uh, in 1 Peter, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. There you see that word test. And here's another one. He says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said through Isaac, your, seed, your, off, your offspring shall be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. And this one's uh, especially pretty interesting to think about, because who was it that tested Abraham? Who was it? And you go back to the book of Genesis and you can see. Uh, in the book of Genesis it says very plainly, After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I mean, there we have it in plain English that God tested Abraham. But here's the question. Although God tested Abraham, while he was testing him, was he also tempting him to do something that was evil or something that was wrong? Well, I believe we see the answer to this in the book of James where we see both uses of this word used in the same paragraph where they're contrasted. As James tells us, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. There you see the word. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And from this we can see a couple of important things. Number one, God does test us. God does allow trials and difficulties into our life for good purposes of his own. And the other, though, is that he will never, ever try to get us to do something evil. And sometimes when he allows trials or difficulties into our life, it may be that it is to discipline us. Maybe we're doing something that, that is not pleasing him, that's harmful to us, and he needs to get our attention about that. But it may not be for discipline at all. It may just be that it's, some, it's an area that he wants us to grow in. Something that, he, that we need to go through some difficulty in order to grow and experience that. And he may allow a difficulty into our life just to show us where we have grown. But when we find ourselves thinking some kind of an evil thought or, or wanting to do something that is wrong, then that is not God who's doing that. That is our reaction. That, that comes from within ourself when we are seeking to do something that is wrong. And once again, basing our understanding of who God is on Scripture, we read in 1 John that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. And the original language is very emphatic. No, not one darkness. And as he tells us in 1 Peter that we're to be holy because He is holy. Now God is never ever going to try to get us to think a bad thought in our head or get us to do some kind of a wrong action. Because He's pure and holy. But he may allow evil things into our life for his own good purpose to teach us and help us learn things that we need to understand. And think about it this way. Would you say that it's good for a person to go without sleep? 
No, I, I wouldn't think so. Is it good to go hungry, to skip meals? Is it a good thing to stand out in the freezing water somewhere, you know, carrying a log over your head or, or, or something like that, or to, or to climb up to difficult heights where you may fall and break your bones? Are those things good? Are those things that you would want your children to do, normally speaking? No. Those are things that we'd all try to avoid, I would say. And yet, when a young man or a young woman enlists in military service for, for the defense of our country, what do we do to them? What does the drill sergeant do? What does the gunny do? Very often, makes them go without sleep. Sometimes they have to skip meals. Sometimes they have to wade through freezing water. Or the one I really love is the Navy SEALs where they lay in the water and do sit-ups in the freezing water with a log across their chest. Staying up ridiculous hours, doing dangerous things, climbing difficult heights, walking on places where they could easily fall and break a bone. And why do we do that? It's because these people have to be prepared for combat. Because that is where, what they're likely going to be sent into. And in the same way, God has to prepare his soldiers, he has to prepare his children for the spiritual combat that we are facing with the unseen enemy every day. And trials and difficulties are the only way we're going to learn these things. And so, yes, he does allow difficult things into our life. But he never tempts us to do evil. And, uh, and what's more, something we else, else we need to recognize about temptation is what he tells us in 1 Corinthians. That no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Say those words with me if you would. Common to man. Say them again. Common to man. One more time. Common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it you know one of the things we're very prone to do as human beings is to believe that our situation is unique nobody else has to go through what I have to go through Nobody else has ever been in my situation. Nobody knows what it's like to be me. I mean, I mean I, I'm dealing with things that nobody else has to deal with. You, you ever felt that way? As a pastor, a big part of what I do regularly is listen to people with their problems and, and, and to take the Word of God and show them what the Word of God has to say about their problem and I love doing it there's nothing that gives me greater joy than being able to sit down with the word of God and to listen to somebody describe a situation or a temptation or a difficulty or something they're struggling with and to show them what the word of God says and have them read it out loud and to see the light come on and say yeah uh -huh, I see this and the longer I do this the more and more impressed I am with the fact that the problems that we have are almost always the same problems that many other people have. Because what are our temptations? They are what? Common to man. And you may feel that you're in a situation right now. And that you're in a, in a difficulty. You're facing a temptation that, that nobody else would understand. And yet... I would be willing to bet, not that I bet, but I would be willing to bet that in a room this size, there's somebody else, at least one other person, who is struggling with the very thing that you're struggling with. But you know, not only do we have that assurance that our temptations are common to man, and God's never going to give us something that we can't handle, Here's another even greater assurance that we have, that someone knows exactly how we feel and what we're dealing with it. 
The verse that I inadvertently passed over was how that God actually did lead his son into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Do you know one of the reasons why God did that was? The scripture said that therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And although Jesus is God, he came to earth as a fully human man in every respect. When he stepped on a thorn, it hurt his foot. When he got sawdust in his eyes, he blinked and he cried. He was a fully human man, and he had to go through temptation as a fully human man so that he would understand what it's like to be us. And not only did he do that, though, but because he conquered every temptation, he was able to destroy the work of the devil that made us a slave to him and made us a slave in that prison house of sin that we talked about and set us free and be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So that we could go free. He understands full well what it's like to be tempted. But not only that. He has actually faced every temptation that you ever will. Because listen to this. He says we do not have a high priest. Who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who in every respect. Say that with me. Every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And this precious verse that we quote so often and that we claim so often that we can go into God's throne room as his children, boldly accepted by him to receive the things that we need, this is actually given to us in the context of temptation, of dealing with the things that that lead us into sin. And just once again, this takes us right back to where we are here in Matthew as the Lord is teaching us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Friends, we need to go to God every day with our vulnerability to sin and bring that to him so that he can deliver us from it. And just very very quickly here, I just want to talk about the where. Because as we ask him not to bring us into temptation, that causes us to ask another question, doesn't it? As we don't want him to lead us into temptation, then that's the question of, well, where is he leading us then? And where are we perhaps leading ourselves? It was many years ago, uh, while we were in Ecuador, I was having a conversation with, uh, with a certain individual who was involved in a relationship with a woman. The only problem was, was this woman was married to somebody else. And yet all the while, this man kept saying and talking about how that God had brought this woman into his life. Now once again, using scripture, what God has revealed about himself, if God is the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, and if God is the one who says that even if you look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart, then I think we're on pretty safe ground to say that it was not God who brought somebody else's wife into your bed. It wasn't God who did that. That was you. And once again, we need to remember what it says in James, where he says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? By his own desire. And as we ask God every day, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
we need to consider the question of where is God leading me and where am I leading myself? If you have a drinking problem, do you think that God is the one leading you into the bar with your buddies to watch the football game? If you have a problem with pornography, do you think that God is the one leading you to spend hours and hours on your computer by yourself or with your smartphone? Do you think he's the one leading you to that bench in the mall outside Victoria's Secret where you can look at all the pictures? If your family relationship is already strained, do you think God is the one leading you to take on one more activity, one more sport, one more job, one more thing that has to be done? Or are you doing that yourself? If you ask God not to bring you into temptation, be sure that your own feet aren't carrying you there. One of the last commandments Jesus gave his closest followers in the garden was, Watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And over this time that we've, been, that we've spent in this passage of the Lord's Prayer, the Lord has, has convicted me of many things and has impressed many things upon me, but above all, just reinforced this truth. And friends, I just really hope that you get this is that praying is where it's at, folks. Because prayer is what puts us in touch with our Father who can meet our every need and unleashes the ultimate power in the universe in our lives. In fact, Scripture says the very power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that is at work in us. And we tap into that when we pray. And I think the most tragic thing that could happen as, as a result of this series, will be for us to go out of here and say, man, that was some really interesting stuff that the pastor said about prayer. And have nothing in your life change about the way you do pray. When you go to the Lord, remember that he's your father. Take time to think about who you're really talking to. And you'll find that just in doing that, very many of your prayers will already be answered. Remember that he is holy and seek for him to be holy in your life. Pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done and for his will to be done in every aspect of your life. Ask for forgiveness for the times that you have sinned against other people as we all do. And, and be ready to extend that forgiveness to the people who sin against you. And pray that he doesn't lead you into temptation. Bring to him every day your vulnerability to sin. Take that to him and ask him to deliver you from it. And once again, just as Oswald Chambers said, the devil is terrified of godly people who pray because he has no defense against that. And friend, that's where it's at and that's where we need to be. And Father, once again, as we come to you this morning, Lord, we do praise you that we can call you Father. It's the idea that the God who made the stars and the God who made the mountains and the oceans and the fish and the, and the animals and, and people and the joy of human relationships, that all of this had its origin in your heart, Lord, and you spoke it into being. And we get to call you Father because you've taken our sin away. Father, I just thank you so much for giving us your word and revealing it to us. And Lord, I pray, Lord, and I would just echo the words of the disciple who said, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray every day. And may we learn by doing as we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be at the back there to greet you. If you have anything you'd like to pray about and need that you have, uh, feel free to come and talk about it. And be sure to stay for the lunch we're having next door. We'd be most glad to have you. Y'all have a good day.